In this video, I'd like to go over the essentials of schematic design for Silink Zinc based system on chips. Silink Zinc system on chips are essentially a combination of a hard processor core, so an ARM Cortex A9 in the case we'll be looking at, and an FPGA on both one single chip. So you have this fixed processing system consisting of this ARM Cortex, as well as a fully programmable FPGA on board a single IC. Now zinc system on chips come in various flavors. The one I've chosen for this design because I've just found some on Mouser is essentially the lowest or entry level zinc chip. Here's an overview of the zinc processing system. As I said before, we have this hard processing unit over here consisting of an ARM Cortex A9, various flash controllers, DDR controllers and so forth, as well as some nice peripherals, for example, gigabit ethernet, USB high speed, STIO and various other interconnects. Internally, we also have these interconnect structure with Axi ports and high performance Axi ports that connect to the programmable logic, so essentially an FPGA. And depending on which Zing chip you use, this can be very, very powerful. Even the baseline is comparable to about an Artix FPGA from Xilinx. Now, FPGA hardware design is rather more complicated than simple microcontrollers, and the Zing processing system adds another level on top of that because there's much more to configure and much more to take care of. What I want to be designing for myself, what I'm currently working on is a system on module. So essentially I'm designing one of these boards containing the system on chip, the signing zinc, with DDR memory, some flash memory, EMC, voltage regulators, and then some mezzanine or board to board connectors. So once I've made one of these modules, I can simply create a daughter board, which is far simpler to design and reuse my system on module. Now there are many of these system on modules already available, but I'm quite a fan of doing things myself. Zinc and FPGA hardware design can be quite daunting and there are many, many different data sheets, application notes and manuals that you'll need to read through to do this. For example, the system on chip packaging pinout, there's a technical reference manual with almost 2000 pages, the memory interface solution manual, PCB design guide, how to connect DDR3 memory, and much, much more. So this is one way of going about it and this is the route I've tried to go. There's also another way which is looking at pre-made boards. For example, this Mini Z by AVNet. Digiland also has some boards made, for example, the RT series, which you can look at, and they oftentimes provide open source schematics. So at least that you can essentially look at and get inspired by. So the Mini Z, in my case, actually uses the same zinc chip that I'm using, and the design is fairly similar. So it's oftentimes good to cross-reference to see if you're doing things right. Let's move over to Altium now and then look at the schematic design in a bit more detail. Before we get started, a huge thank you to Altium for sponsoring this video. I oftentimes use Altium to design far more complicated boards than I do in KiCad, especially this design containing DDR memory with high speed interfaces and so on. I always will use Altium. You can try it Altium for yourself if you go to altium.com forward slash yt forward slash Phil's lab to get yourself a free trial of Altium Designer. Here I am in Altium Designer and I've called my system module the Zbrett, which is German essentially for the Z board. What I like to do for more complicated designs is section my schematics into multi-page schematics, having the first page be an overview page. So this overview page tells me, okay, I've got these seven other schematic pages with various numbers, and this will help with component labeling as well. I have my title block filled in, and also a brief description of what all of these schematic pages will do. We'll go through them one by one. We'll go through the power, which contains various regulators, and for system on chips and FPGAs, you typically need quite a lot of different voltage rails, so not just 3.3 volts, you might need 1.8, 1.0, 1 1.35, and so on. We also need a DDR termination regulator, which we'll go into more detail. On the next page, we have the zinc power and configuration, which means the zinc core voltages, decoupling capacitors, the JTAG and configuration pins. Then the next page is the zinc programmable logic, which is called PL, I will oftentimes find PL and PS in zinc designs. PL is the programmable logic, that means the FPGA part. And we have two banks in that design. Then we have the processing system, which is denoted by PS. We have two banks for this particular IC, bank 500 and bank 501. We also have to connect some QSPI memory from which the zinc system on chip will boot. The zinc can run embedded Linux, which is pretty cool. And we have some EMC memory for storage. Then we have uh, another processing system bank, bank 501, and this is essentially free to use and gets broken out to mezzanine connectors. We are using DDR3 low power memory, so DDR3L memory, and the zinc has dedicated DDR pins for that. Lastly, we have the mezzanine connectors, so the connectors which go from board to board plug into our daughter board. Starting off with the power supplies, you can see this rather large schematic section over here, and this is actually a quad buck converter. As I said before, for the system on chip or for FPGAs in general, we need quite a lot of different voltages. In particular, for this zinc design, 
I need a core voltage of 1.0 volts. I have one bank running at 1.8 volts, another bank running at 3.3 volts, and I'm also generating this 1.35 voltage, and this is for my DDR memory. I'm using DDR3L, which runs at normally 1.35 volts, rather than DDR3, which would run at 1.5 volts. Now you can also use DDR3, you can also use DDR2, I happen to go with DDR3L. The design of this buck converter is fairly straightforward. It's a max 20029, and this particular package already has preset voltages at 1 volt, 1.8 volt, then an adjustable channel, and then a 3.3 volt. So this is pretty well suited to our FPGA or system on chip design. Essentially channel 3 is adjustable because this will depend on what kind of DDR memory we are using. So in my case, I want this to want be 1.35 volts, but someone else might want to be using DDR3 memory, which is 1.5 volts. So I th thought this chip was quite suitable, and in one IC I can get four output voltages. Luckily, all the MOSFETs and so forth are inside this IC, so I simply need all same valued inductors, output decoupling capacitors, and input decoupling capacitors. Typically, these quad buck converters run off a fairly low input voltage, and I believe this one goes up to about 6.5 volts, so I've chosen normally 5 volts at my input. Now FPGAs are quite power hungry devices and system on chips even more so, so this quad buck converter is specced at 1.5 amps output current for each single channel. You can see on the left I have this resistor network and essentially I have these enable signals which enable a certain channel of this buck converter as well as power good signals which require a pull up resistor because they are open drain pins. Now it's not as straightforward as simply enabling all of these at the same time. That's because the FPGA or the system on chip has a particular startup sequence. And I've denoted that here. And this is again, if you read through the various technical reference manuals, you will find this. So once my input voltage is applied, I want 1.0 volts first, 1.8, 1.35, 3.3, 3, and then 0 0.675, which we'll see in just a second. And that's essentially half this 1.35. And we'll see later why we need that. And this startup sequence is achieved by triggering these enable from the various power good pins, for example, like this. On my final power good, so once I've enabled my last buck converter or voltage output, I've simply used a transistor to switch this LED. And this is just to show, okay, the board is somewhat alive, at least the power rails seem to be working and good. So other than this quad buck converter, we also have this regulator down here. And this is a DDR3 VTT regulator. And VTT is the termination voltage required for DDR3 memory. Essentially the termination voltage will be used via pull-up resistors on the address lines of the DDR3L memory. And this has to be at half of the DDR3 voltage, so 1.35 volts divided by 2. And this is our VTT reference voltage generated by these resistors over here. And this schematic is pretty much taken directly from the datasheet. We'll see more about this when we come to the DDR section of this design. On the next page, we have the zinc power and configuration pins. Now, these are only some of the zinc power pins. Essentially, these are what I like to call the core voltages, even though the core voltages are pretty much only the 1.0 volt pins. I also have auxiliary voltages, for example, 1.8 volts, and a PLL voltage over here at also 1.8 volts. And all of these decoupling capacitors you can find in the relevant data sheets. For example, if I open the Zinc 7000 system on chip PCB design guide and look for decoupling, I can see under the power distribution system on page 13, if I click on that, I can see the recommended PCB capacitors per device. Now if I go down, I am using the Zinc 7007S in this package, so the 225 pin, 225 pin package. And you can see for these voltages and these banks, I require these certain number of capacitors. So quite a lot and quite a lot more than, for example, an MCU design. So what I've done is essentially just transferred that information over to my schematic, and that's why you see all of these parallel capacitors at these various banks. You have to also take special care that you make sure the voltages are within range. And for example, this PLL voltage, the datasheet might tell you that you might need additional filtering, for example, this ferret bead over here. Not only is the amount of decoupling and the values important, but also the placement later when we get to the PCB design. And this is especially critical for these high-speed designs with DDR3 memory and these high-performance FPGAs and system on chips. So the schematic, even though it might look a bit daunting, the PCB design is a work of its own. Other than these voltages and these decoupling capacitors and ground connections over here, you can also see how many ground connections we indeed have. We also have some configuration pins over here. This is grouped up in various voltages, so you might have VCCO underscore zero, and this is the zeroth bank, and we run that at 3.3 volts, and again, this is something you would get from the datasheet. This VCC bat pin over here, and it turns out if I'm not using bitstream encryption, I can simply tie that to 1.8 volts, otherwise I would need to use an external battery. 
We also have an internal analog to digital converter, which I believe is a 12 bit analog to digital converter, oftentimes called the XADC for Silinx, FPGAs, and system on chips. That requires some additional filtering on the 1.8 volt rail, as well as on the ground connection. So I have my digital ground here and my analog ground here. And this is all detailed, again, in data sheets, reference manuals, and so forth. On the other side, we have our main programming interface, which for Silinx FPGAs is JTAG. And we typically require four signals for that. The clock, TMS, TDI, data in, data out. You probably will get away with not using pull-ups, but Silinx recommends pull-ups on at least TMS and TDI. Then we have these various configuration pins. So init and this underscore B denotes essentially inverted logic. We have done and we have program as well as this config BVS underscore zero. On that note, I'd recommend this site here by AVNet, and I'll leave a link in the description. And this tells you all about the zinc pins. So if I scroll down, I can see, okay, we have some various different pin names, which might seem a bit strange when you're coming from a microcontroller world. For example, this pull up DC underscore B, all these pins and so forth. And here you can also see what, for example, these init B and program B and done pins do, and also in the Silinx data sheets. In short, these pins are set when the FPGA has reprogrammed itself, has loaded the bitstream. So these pins are essentially for configuration, but they will also require pull-out resistors. And sometimes you can also add switches to them if you want to change their value, for example, the program pin. This config BVS pin, I've tied to 3.3 volts. And if you read the day sheets, again, if we pull this high, it says that the bank voltage of bank zero should be 3.3 volts. And this is why this pin over here, VCC00, is tied to 3.3 volts. You can also see these reference voltage pins here for the XADC, so VRF plus and VRFN. So this is a differential reference voltage, but we can tie them to ground and then simply use the XADC's internal VRF just for simplicity. In more involved designs where you'll be relying on precise readings from the ADC, you would want to use a dedicated voltage reference at these pins. On the fourth page of the schematic, we finally come to the programmable logic, which is essentially the FPGA part of this chip. And this is divided for this chip into two banks. So we have bank 34 and we have bank 35. Each bank can run off a different voltage. For example, I've chosen to run bank 34 of 3.3 volts. And this is because I would like to interface this bank with the outside world via mezzanine connectors. And typical or user-friendly voltages are around 3.3 volts. Again, the decoupling capacitor selection is based on the datasheet you just saw. You can see we need quite a lot of decoupling, and this is quite tedious when you come to PCB layout and routing. We need some larger caps over here, going all the way down to 470 nanofarads. You can also see the labeling of these pins. So we usually have somewhat differential pairs, so L1P, L1N, and so forth, belong to a certain bank. Now you can use them differentially, but you can also use them as a single-ended configuration. You'll also see pins, for example, labeled DQS, or VREF, or SRC, or MRCC. And again, the datasheet will tell you more about that. This PUDC underscore B pin, however, is important. And essentially I've pulled this high and it's specified that you need a one kilo ohm resistor. And this means that the programmable logic, so these PL banks 34 and banks 35, will have their pull-ups disabled during configuration. This is typically what you would want unless your design requires otherwise. So these things can kind of catch you out if you're not used to them. You might see, okay, these pins look all the same. These are just general purpose pins, but then somewhere hidden in there, you might have these labels, which requires you to do something. We have something similar for the bank 35, which is a smaller bank, and we also have our analog to digital converter channels running on this bank. Again, decoupling capacitors, and I'm tied this to 3.3 volts. Now you can also see we have a PL, or programmable logic clock, and this is at 100 megahertz, and this is a simple CMOS oscillator. I'm using a series resistor to essentially slow down the rising and falling edges, and this helps with EMI and signal integrity. Don't forget your decoupling or bypassing for anything that switches as well. Now you don't need to use a programmable logic clock because this programmable logic can actually be fed via the processing system clock, which we'll soon see. But I've chosen just to add an additional clock for me to play around with. And clocks can only be tied to essentially SRCC or MRCC pins. MRCC, as labeled here, stands for multi-region capable clocks. So by feeding it into an MRCC pin, I can feed various different parts of my FPGA design. And again, I always like to make little notes, for example, down here, that the PL can be clocked internally by the processing system clock. Now we move on to the processing system pins. This is where it gets a bit more involved. This schematic page is sectioned into various parts. This is the actual zinc part of the schematic. So again, we have a bank for the processing system. In this case, we have bank 500 and bank 501. Bank 500 runs off 3.3 volts and requires these decoupling capacitors. And then you have these MIO pins, and these are multifunction pins, so to speak. We have these MIO pins, we have this clock input, and this is a clock that is required to be placed to clock the processing system. 
So I've chosen 33.33 megahertz, and I believe this is the standard frequency for this sync design. However, if you look at the data sheets, you can find that it's between 30 megahertz and 60 megahertz that need to be input at this clock pin. And I found this by looking at a different data sheet. Again, this is the DC and AC switching characteristics data sheet, another 73 page document. And if I look for PS underscore clock, I can find that my clock frequency can range from 30 to 60 megahertz. The zinc then by using internal PLLs can change that clock frequency and clock different parts of the chip. Again, this clock frequency is coming from down here from a dedicated 33.33 megahertz clock. And this is very similar to the 100 megahertz chip you saw. Now for the FPGA part, so the programmable logic part, it was fairly straightforward. Everything is considered a general purpose or multifunction pin. For the processing system part, we actually have to decide on what these pins are before we continue with the design. The way we do that is via Vivado. Now Vivado is the main free programming environment for Silings FPGAs. There's also VTIS, which we can use for programming these Zincs with C++, or when we use, for example, a soft core processor, such as a Microblaze for Silings devices. You can download Silence Provider for free and have a play around with simulation, configuring devices. And there's also a nice getting started guide by Digilent, which teaches you the basics of Vivado. I've got Vivado open here, and this is what it looks like, and quite daunting if you haven't seen it before. This is where I do my pinout planning for Zinc devices. So I can go and open a block design, in this case, and this opens this graphical user interface. I can add various blocks here, for example, IP, so intellectual property. I can add CAN, PCI Express, Gigabit Ethernet, and so forth. But I've added this Zinc device over here. This is because I just want to do pinout planning for the moment. So I can double click on that. And here I can see, if I expand this a tiny bit, what parts of my Zinc I've enabled, what I'm using. So this is the overall view of the Zinc device with the processing system and the programmable logic. I can go through various tabs to see what interfaces I have, but for me at the moment, I'm interested in these peripheral IO pins. If I click on that, I can see, okay, here I have my various banks, so bank 500, which is bank zero, and bank 501, which is bank one. I can choose the voltage standard this bank uses. So for bank zero, I've chosen 3.3 volts. For bank one, I've chosen 1 1.8, and I'll show you why in just a second. But once you've done that, you can choose what peripherals you want to use, and this will tell you what pins you didn't have to designate. I want some quad SPI flash memory because I would like to boot my Linux or my system and program from this chip. I also might want Ethernet, I want, might want an SD card, UART, and you can choose these various peripherals. So once you've chosen the peripherals, you just have to simply transfer that over to your schematic. And this configuration is exactly what I've transferred in Altium Design into the schematic. So what are the QSBI flash memory pins, clock pins, EMC pins, and so forth. All of that I can take pretty much directly from Vivado. I have to make sure my bank voltages are of course the same. I've included a little LED just to make sure, okay, when I first get this board in my hands, I can at least try and flash an LED to see if my basic structure is working. So I have my QSBI flash memory connections. I have my EMMC data connections. EMMC memory is over here, and this is a fairly fine pitch, 0.5 millimeter pitch BGA package. So quite a pain in the neck to root. This requires certain decoupling capacitors. And again, this is given by the data sheet, as well as these pull-ups on these various lines. In Altium, you will see this more and more in the design. I'm using these blankets and directives. So I'm essentially grouping various signals, for example, all of the EMMC data signals and clock signals, because at the end of the day, in the PCB design and layout, these will have to have matched time, matched length. Similarly, for the QSBI flash memory, I have the data and clock signals, again with a blanket, to give myself some directives and then to set some rules later on in the design process. There's also another point for this bank in particular, and these are these MIO pins, or MIO2 to MIO8 pins. And this is again something you get from the data sheet. These are multifunction pins, so when this zinc device boots up, it will look at these, the state of these pins to see if they're high or low, and then determine how it should boot. And this is an extract I've pulled from a data sheet. This will tell you what MIO pins 2 to 8 do, that I can boot from a quad SPI memory, from JTAG, if the PLLs are enabled, what bank voltages I'm running at, and all of that information I've used to then pull my signal lines high and low. And again, I've detailed that in a little comment over here. Now moving on, this is bank 501 on its own page, and you can see that most of this is unconnected. Firstly, we have 1.8 volts at this bank, and this is what we saw in Vivado as well. But we also see that we have just these general pins going out here. And this is because I want to root out these pins to the mezzanine connectors. So whatever my daughter board or carry board designer wants to put on them, for example, Ethernet or USB, these can be reconfigured and don't have a set purpose. Except, for example, these UART, TX and RX lines, because this is usually the main way of communicating or debugging is via a dedicated UART connection. And on the daughter board, this will then be a USB to UART converter. 
I also have this system reset pin, which I typically just pull high. You can also attach a button or feed this off to a different point in your circuit. The reason I've chosen 1.8 volts is because the daughter board designer might want to use ethernet or USB. Anytime you have some sort of high speed interfaces, you'll probably have problems using 3.3 volts. Essentially HSTL is for high speed and that's a 1.8 volts and enables you to use ethernet, for example. And this is why I've got 1.8 volts running here because I want to provide the most amount of flexibility if the end designer does want to use ethernet on the carrier board. Next, we come to a rather large part of the schematic, and that is the DDR3L memory. It looks quite daunting, but it's a lot of the same. Again, we have the zinc device pins on the left here. This is all to do with the DDR memory controller. We have our bank voltage, which for DDR3L memory needs to be at 1.35 volts with the required decoupling. We also have a reference voltage input, which is half the DDR3 supply memory with a tiny bit of decoupling exit as well. From that, we have all of the address lines, up to 15 address lines, so A0 to A15. I've chosen to use this memory because it's fairly inexpensive. It's DDR3 low power, but it's fairly small at about 2 gigabit. 2 gigabit means we don't need the last address line, so I just simply leave that unconnected. All of these address lines then go over here into the relevant pins of the DDR3 memory. Now you can also see immediately that I have all of these termination resistors at about 40 ohms each, and they are being pulled up to this VTT voltage, which is half the DDR3L supply voltage. And this is required for better signal integrity. Now if you keep your lines short on the PCB, you probably won't need them, but I've kept them in for routing practice and just because I want to see the effects. These will have to be on your address lines, your bank address lines, as well as your control lines. Now the VTT lines require quite heavy decoupling as well, which you can see up here, and these have to be placed very close to the pull-up resistors. We'll see that in a later video when we do the PCB layout and routing. So I've also done the same for the bank addresses, for the row address strobes, column address strobes, these various control signals, and so forth. Again, I'm using a blanket and a directive to tell me later how to need to match these signals in time. DDR memory doesn't only have address command and control signals, but also data signals. And these are typically organized in byte lanes, so BL for short. I'm using a 16-bit wide data chip, so two 8-bit byte lanes, so I have DQ0 to DQ7 and DQ8 to DQ15. For each byte lane, I also have a data mask, as well as my data strobe, or essentially my clock signal for these data lines. And again, these have blankets and are simply connected to my DDR memory. Now they go straight in without any termination, the DDR chip itself has some external resistors it needs, for example, a port on resistor on the reset line, and this said Q line is for calibration of the on die termination. And this typically requires a 240 ohm resistor. Now, as you can imagine later in layout and routing, this will be quite a pain, especially all these parallel lines having to be matched in time with termination resistors, proper placement of decoupling, and so forth. The DDR3L memory as well also requires some serious decoupling as shown here, this is simply taken from the manufacturer's reference designs, application notes, and data sheets. Now, finally, we've come to the last page, and that is that of the mezzanine connectors. I've chosen to go with three mezzanine connectors so I can arrange them away that I can only put the board in in a certain position or in one position. So I have one which contains my bank 34 pins, and you see I've arranged them as differential pairs and made sure I've provided enough ground pins around them. The next mezzanine connector carries also bank 34 and bank 35 pins, JTAG configuration, as well as 5 volts as my input, and 3.3 volts just if I want to tap as an output. The last connector carries all these MIO pins from the processing system, as well as 1.8 volts, because that is the reference voltage or the bank voltage for bank 501. Then we have these various configuration pins, as well as the UART signals. So that pretty much sums up very briefly the schematic design or some of the steps you might need to think of when you're designing a system on module for the Silink Sync series. And this will apply quite a bit to other system on chips as well as FPGA designs. And we'll be looking at the layout and routing of this board in future videos.